Okay, thanks, Ivan. Um, okay, welcome everybody today. Um, um, Ivan has given me a very generous introduction, but for anyone who doesn't know me, um, I'm the first year coordinator, which means I'm the mum and dad of the first years. So I'm probably also the cleaner and the plumber. Uh, and these are some of the things that um, I try and do as part of the first year experience. And uh, today I, I want to talk to you a bit about um, some work I've done in a first year course with some introductory design activities. And I've actually had to move today into a different office because they are drilling like crazy uh, outside my window. So I'm actually in a different space today. So, and I'll just get the presentation to behave itself. So on the menu today, just a couple of things I'd like to talk about. Um, I'd like to talk a bit about um, some of the background um, and literature about first year curriculum and assessment. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the course um, that this sits in, which is creative engineering, which is taken um, in first trimester of the course. And um, this presentation is about something called the design workbook, which is an assessment item that sits in creative engineering. Um, this presentation today is probably um, a much more longer version of something I'm going to present at A squared, E squared later this year. Um, and I want to talk to you a bit about a survey and some of the results that I did related to this design workbook in first year and just some of the things I'm planning to do for 2023. But also there's a couple of things that may also help you um, depending on what your course is. So to start with, uh, I'll just see if I can get my screen a little less messy. Um, so as I don't know how many people out there. Are there many people out there that teach in first year out of curiosity? Um, there may be some out there that are in first year as well, but um, you may know that um, first year is a challenging time, as you can see on the screen here. Um, and I've got some quotes here about um, first year being quite a challenging time for students still trying to figure out what on earth am I? I'm a uni student now. What does that actually mean? Um, and whether they be transitioning from high school or whether it be from uh, maybe a mature age student coming into uni um, there is quite a bit of a time where people are still trying to figure out well what on earth does it mean to be a uni student and they typically in my first point here they typically have lots of other challenges and it can be things like um, related to finance or as you can see on the screen I've got some images it can be on the bottom left hand side, it can be adjusting now to online lectures and how do we deal with that. Um, it can be in the middle picture, particularly group work. I find a lot of students really struggle with addressing to group work and from speaking with them, there seems to be very little group work in high school, which is quite different from when I went to high school. Um, and they also have to balance um, time, financial commitments, um, transport. Many of them are probably working way too many hours. Um, so it is a really challenging time for many of them. Um, so my second point here, the first year curriculum and assessment, it has a major role in how we support students making that jump successfully to becoming a university student, but also, um, and perhaps even more importantly, connecting to whatever their discipline might be, um, whether it be engineering or whatever the discipline might be. Um, and in my case, I've got engineers, I've got industrial designers, I have some students from some other courses as well. So first year has a major role in helping people make sense of their experience and whatever their future discipline will be. Uh, moving on. Um, when you consider the curriculum also, there's some key roles of the curriculum and I've got from KIFT here. Um, there are four points on slide now. Um, the first one, be engaging. Yes, ideally um, you would want your curriculum to be engaging. Uh, you want your students to, to learn and be engaged in what they're doing. And that's why I've got the second point here. You really should be um, promoting learning in an active way um, rather than bashing people to death um, with a very passive approach. Uh, my third point, uh, more and more students are needing to be exposed or understand all the different learning environments they're going to meet at uni. Um, for example, at Griffith, um, we use something called PebblePad. We're moving to Canvas. We have been using Blackboard. Um, students might be having a lecture and collaborate, um, or they might be having some kind of combination hybrid approach, uh, or many of them, they might be having a lecture for the first time face-to-face -face, um, where what's the difference between a lecture and a tutute? Many of them don't seem to realize that. And so the curriculum has to give exposure to all the different ways um, in which they're going to learn throughout their degree. And the final point here, um, and particularly for me in my role in first year, um, but I think the same type of thing applies regardless of what year you're in, uh, there needs to be some way of monitoring how students are doing in your course. 
um, so you can then do something about it and whether that be um, some kind of intervention um, or, or looking at what you support might be required or when people are floundering, particularly in the early weeks of a course. So these are some of the roles that the curriculum has to have. And moving on from that, uh, the joy of assessment. So here's some lovely key quotes from the assessment li literature. Um, you might all um, say, well, we often commonly hear that um, pretty much our students are very much assessment driven. Um, there are lovely ways of phrasing that. So my first point here, uh, assessment frames learning. Um, and that really sets the scene for their learning experience and pretty much um, promotes everything they do in the courses. Uh, and so if you can think about what your assessment might be, you can really have a look at how you're going to um, get some of that learning behaviour that you're looking for. It doesn't guarantee it, of course. Um, people have different approaches to assessment, but certainly it's a big part of the learning experience for students. And my second point here, uh, um, there's an argument that if you can link assessment to students' interests um, and what they may be concerned about, maybe you can actually promote more genuine learning or deeper learning. Is there a way of saying, okay, well, how can my assessment link to what students are interested in or give them an opportunity uh, so their interests can flower um, through the interest or through the assessment that you may be doing? And that way it can be more productive. So some lovely quotes there that drive a lot of the ways that I see when I drive a course. Moving on, oh, oh, I've gone back one. And the last thing I want to talk about here is uh, I talked already before about um, how first year is an important time. There is this notion of assessment for transition. So again, there's still, we can use the assessment to guide that transition. Assessment is not just meant to be this sledgehammer that till gives us marks. It's also meant to be a way of supporting that transition from um, prior to uni to becoming a uni student. And as they go later on through the rest of the degrees, the years, how can we also transition to later year courses? Um, my second point at Griffith and, and probably many other universities, um, we, there is a requirement that we have a, a light assessment item or a low weighted assessment item fairly early um, so that you can do something. So if someone has a, an assessment item, it's typically somewhere between five to 10%, usually due somewhere in weeks three to five. Um, then you can act on the performance on that. If someone doesn't submit it or if they do very badly, you can do something about it. Um, it's very dangerous in courses to have something, the first piece of feedback they get is in week 10. If they're not doing well, what are they supposed to do with that? Um, so it's very important to have something early um, so that uh, people can have a sense of how they're doing, but also the teaching staff can do something about it. Um, I've put a link there. Um, it doesn't seem to be widely known. Um, uh, we have a learning department, uh, which was called um, Learning Futures. Um, and it seems there's something called the Griffith Course Design Standards. I'm not even sure if they're widely known or promoted, um, but for anyone attending this webinar, it may be worth having a look at them because there's some quite good things. And I've put the link to the document there. I believe it's publicly available, but if you are from an external union, you can't access it, please let me know. Um, we really should be thinking about um, the standards we use to design our courses to make sure that they are successful and they make sense with some of the things that we're trying to do at uni. So there's some of the um, concepts from the literature that, that um, embed or underneath some of the things that I do. So uh, enough of literature, let's have a look at my course. Um, so I'd like to talk about uh, the course Creative Engineering. Um, so I've got a couple of points here on screen, as you can see, it's a project-based learning course. It's their first exposure to project-based learning at uni for many of the students. Uh, so it can be quite challenging, um, but um, generally the feedback is quite good. Um, the second point here, how is the course structured? They have a three hour studio class each week and there is an optional common time session each week, um, except for week one from memory. And uh, so the studio class, that's an opportunity where they can work with their group. I typically do like a mini lecture and then an activity and a mini lecture and an activity. There's usually a mix of um, things that they have to do. And I might do a, um, a short presentation. Um, there are also times when I ask them to watch a video outside of class. Um, the pseudo class is also a good chance for them to work with their group on the project and they need that time to do so. Now, each week there's also a common time 
Um, this is optional, but it's a timetabled area in people's timetables, hopefully, um, when um, I know that they should be free and they can meet to work on their course project. Or I also use that time to answer questions about degrees, majors, transfers, whatever, anything about first year, I'm happy to help. Um, and I also use that time as my general consultation time. Some students use that every week uh, as a chance to work. Others attend at will. Others attend during the, the busiest times of the particular term when there's an assessment item due and they need that time. Um, the course has three cohorts, um, engineers, industrial design, um, but also there is this other degree, which I can never say smoothly, but it's the Bachelor of Intelligent Digital Technologies. Just doesn't run off the tongue. Um, it's a degree from ICT um, where the director of that particular degree wanted the students to have some exposure to the design process. So I've got a few from that particular degree as well. Now the project uh, for the term, it's one project and they work on it in stages and it links everything to the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals. And I've given you an example here. Um, so this uh, in recent years, there's usually three project options students can choose, and I've given you one example there where they had to design a product or infrastructure to make cities safer, um, and I normally would specify a particular target group, and in this case it was mobility impaired elderly people on public transport, and, and that was one of the project options. Um, other projects are typically aligned something to do with energy, um, and there's typically something to do with waste, and I try and change at least one project option each year. So that will give you a bit of a sense about what the aims of the course. What does the assessment look like on this screen? This is a bit of an overview of what the assessment is, and you can see um, it's about 40% group um, and 60% individual. And the focus of this presentation today, I want to talk about the design workbook, um, which is uh, worth 10%. Um, it's due at the end of the term, but it's actually done progressively throughout the term. The course does have a hurdle. Um, they have the final design portfolio, which is individual. They have to submit it and get at least a minimum of 40% of the marks on that portfolio. Typically what happens is um, the final portfolio is their um, individual story of the journey during the term. Um, and if they are trying to ride or hide in their group, they generally cannot do the portfolio and typically fail. Um, but today I want to talk about the design workbook. So what is it? Well, it's 10%, as I've said. Now it's six 2% tasks. You might instantly be thinking, hang on a minute, six by two is 12. But um, what they actually get is they get um, up to 10 from the best five. So typically um, it allows them to miss one if they're required, if they're sick or something happens. And so I take a mark up to 10 from the best five. Many of them do all six anyway, um, but I, I did get requests for, can I have 12 marks? But no, 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 sorry, I told you it was only 10. Um, but um, that's basically um, what the task is. It is managed in PebblePad, which is our um, the e-portfolio system that we use at Griffith, but it could be done, um, it doesn't have to be in any portfolio, I just chose to use it in the system because I'm exposing them to it, um, as it's something that they will be using throughout their degree. Um, now, next to the target here, these were my goals, um, and so I was trying to get students to link course topics to their own interest, um, and I wanted to make sure that they can see links between some of the topics we're covering or they're wrestling with and engineering and also design in general. Um, and as I said, I wanted to get students intro to the Pebble Med, sorry, Pebble Pad system. And number four, uh, we needed it to be quick and easy to mark, um, but it has the aim of monitoring progress. And so typically what we do with these tasks is we mark them in the studio, uh, in the three hour studio each week. Each studio has usually myself and one of the tutor, or sometimes there's one sessions with two of my tutors, but there's always two of us in a class of anywhere between probably about 40 to 60 students in a studio. And so we needed it to be quick and easy to mark um, in that time. And it also allows us to get a sense about what's happening um, across the cohort. Now, there's a couple of features of the design workbook. Um, something I need to state that um, this workbook had a key um, aim of also getting attendance. Um, for any of you out there who teach in first year, 
as part of the transition to becoming in first year, I wanted to make sure I was getting good attendance to keep group projects on track. I didn't want to have a day where three people are missing and there's one there. So one aim of the design workbook is to make sure that people are attending regularly. Um, and so as I've got told, told, told and retold, I made very clear to students that um, to get the activity marks, um, they had to attend the relevant session that week and the task had to be submitted before the deadline, before the workshop started. Not during, not after, but it had to be done before. So I'm trying to make sure that they're developing time management skills and also um, participating in the course appropriately. So um, students could only get a mark if they met those two criteria. So if they were absent, that's a zero. Uh, if the task wasn't submitted, zero. Um, and uh, of course, uh, for those people who had um, you know, medical dramas or whatever, um, they could apply for special consideration. But I did put it in the course outline that work was not an excuse. So if you've got to work, that's your choice. Um, and so I did have um, six opportunities to submit activities so they could get up to 10, but they had to be there and on time um, to get the marks. So how do the activities um, fit in terms of the course? So I've got uh, an, a screenshot or an overview of how the term fits. And so you'll find, um, for example, in week three, there's a presentation. And so an activity was due in week two to make sure I was getting good attendance in the weeks, typically prior to their presentations. And it was a way also of making sure um, people were getting um, marked progressively throughout the term. And I was trying to make sure that every group um, had a good number of people there so they could get their work done accordingly. And so you can see there was an activity six in week 11 um, and they would just get the best five from these six. Um, so the first one was due pretty much straight away uh, as the first assignment is actually due in week three. And so I was trying to make sure that yes, there's good attendance throughout the term. And for anyone who's seen me, um, Dr. Doe, if you're out there in the audience, I, I normally have a ton of people in the class. So it seems to be helping to keep making sure I've got um, good attendance on track. So that's a bit about how it sits in the course. So you might be wondering, well, what exactly are these activities anyway? Well, um, here's some examples. Um, I've given you a short description of some of the activities you can see on the screen now. Uh, so for example, in week two, um, give me a product or a piece of infrastructure that's badly designed. Um, week five, for example, give me a product or infrastructure that's inspired by biomimicry, um, or tell me um, a product or piece of infrastructure that you could improve through biomimicry. And, and these were, um, this is a short description of each activity. And in each activity, there were a couple of other things they had to explain um, to make sure they were meeting um, the outcome I wanted. Um, week eight is worth mentioning. Um, this one um, was about Scamper. Um, it stands for things like substitute, combine, adapt, uh, minify, magnify, P is uh, put it to another use, E, eliminate, R, reduce, and, and there's some other meanings from memory as well. Um, it's a really good tool um, for any design courses, and I've put a link there down the bottom for quite a good handout on Scamper. If you're not familiar with it, it was one of the ones that students responded to the most. And uh, week nine, which was activity five, was about the UN goals. I haven't shown activity six on here, uh, but activity six was about um, how would you improve your group work processes. Um, but the survey I did, which I'll talk about in a moment, focused on the first five. So here is an example of activity one. This is what the students would see. Um, and I had some comments on there. Um, so you had to identify a product or piece of infrastructure, but upload an image uh, of your design. So they could, show, they could take a photo of the design or they could find an image of the design. I would typically ask them, okay, well, why did you choose this thing? And in this case, I asked them, well, why is it badly designed? And tell me, how would you fix it? Um, so I was always trying them to get to think about, like, look at, look around you, look at design around you. What can you do about it? How might you fix it? And so in this case, they had to fix the design, whatever it was. And so on the next screen, here are some examples of images of things they chose. So at the top left, it looks like cordial, uh, but it's actually bleach. Um, so they had suggested, well, this might kill somebody. And so this was something where, well, maybe we should change the packaging or we probably shouldn't have colored bleaches that people could mix in cordial or we could do other things to make it more dangerous, or sorry, less dangerous. Um, on the top, on the right, um, 
this was a uh, push button toilet. Um, one of the students was saying that, okay, in a time of COVID where we were trying to minimize what we touch, uh, maybe rather than requiring us to touch things, maybe we could look at a smarter way of having the toilet um, census. I, I lived in Japan for many years and there were lots of things where there's a little sensor that senses where someone moves in front or away. And that way um, the toilet would flush without you having to touch a button. Um, so the student was suggesting we should be minimizing contact. Um, how can we look at um, improving designs like that? Um, probably my favorite is the train image on the bottom left. How is the disabled person supposed to get over the ledge? Um, perhaps they use their super strong arms to lift themselves up. So there are lots of examples of really silly ideas um, that just don't make sense. And students have suggested lots of ways to fix things like this. And bottom on the right, um, always with computers, they always have something with computers that are um, clearly it's not really designed that well. Um, there's a big adapter, which is now blocking some of the other slots. So clearly there's a bit of an issue there. So some students suggested um, maybe changing the adapter. Other students suggested maybe we space out the plugs a bit more so that it's possible to do that. Um, so they would typically choose things that were all around them. And there were lots and lots of different things that people chose. This is just a sample of some of them. Let's go ahead to activity five. Um, this was an activity related to the UN goals. And I asked them, okay, well, tell me, improve a product or piece of infrastructure um, relevant to a UN goal that you have not covered already in the project that you were doing this term. And again, they'd have to tell me how would they fix it, which goal, and in particular, which target um, are you trying to hit with your redesign or improvement? And some examples here. Um, this was relevant to goal nine. Uh, a student was saying, um, you're in a sports stadium and there's rubbish everywhere. So let's have a more smarter way. Um, and so they were probably proposing some kind of suction system. Um, so you can dispose of things easily. So there's not a huge amount of rubbish everywhere in the stadium. Um, and then another example was the delightful public toilets. Came, this one came up once or twice um, that tend not to be hygienic so there were student this particular student was suggesting ways of um can we make it so there's there's you know there's always a way to have um a way to clean your hands properly and minimize the touch um and also find ways of minimizing waste um inside the toilets themselves and saying they're more hygienic so these are some examples of things that people had said okay so you might be wondering how activities were marked um, so the first time I did this, I had the minimum word limit of 150 words, and they had to meet the criteria I set. So they would have to address um, a certain number of dot points that I had put as a minimum. And two, you've done everything. Um, spelling is good because sometimes uh, spelling was a nightmare and I can't stand that. So I, I normally say, no, no, you need to proofread your work. Um, satisfactory was a one or zero, not done, or there were some other problems with it. Like they might write, if they didn't have 150 words, they would get instant zero. And it wasn't a half mark, less than the word limit zero. Um, and so we did try and make it easy to mark. Um, and so between two of us in a class of between 40 to 60, we could easily mark them in the two hours as we went around and talked to each group. Moving on. So what did I want to know? Well, I was wondering about, okay, well, is there a difference um, in how students perform on these activities? I've got three cohorts in my course um, and I wanted to know, well, do they do anything differently? Is there a problem or anything? Uh, and I wanted to know about what students think about them. I got lots of good feedback um, informally from students and on course feedback surveys, but I wanted to go a bit deeper. And I also wanted to know, well, do actually are these students interesting to students and do they think they're relevant to their future careers, whatever their career might be? So I did a survey. Uh, but let's have a quick look at the marks. This was the marks from earlier this year. So I had lots of engineers, 248 of them, uh, 13 industrial design and 23 from the um, intelligent digital technology, the degree I can never say the name of. Um, and you'll see the mean mark there on screen. I did have a look at the stats for this. And it does seem that the um, students in the IDT degree um, did get significantly lower um, than the others. But, oh, sorry significantly lower than the engineering students. Um, not significantly lower than industrial design, but definitely much lower than engineering. So I, I need to find out a bit about why that might be. So um, I did an online survey in the amazing Lime survey tool, which is very handy. Um, and I did tell the students that to do the survey, you have to have done at least one activity. 
Uh, there was also the option to win a $50 gift card. So I think I had four $50 gift cards available. Um, the survey captured some demographics, um, a couple of statements to agree, disagree with, and some open-ended questions. There's an example there of one, my third point, which activity was the most relevant to your future career? And they could choose from the first five or indicate that none were relevant. Um, and when they selected that, um, it would then ask them, or if they chose an activity, well, why? Why is that activity relevant? You, you chose this activity. I'm interested to know why you think it's relevant to your career. And or if they chose none were relevant, I wanted to know, well, why isn't it relevant? And so here's who answered the survey, bit of a snapshot. Um, small, there were about 79 responses. Um, the main issue was that there were very small numbers from industrial design and intelligent digital technologies, only two from each and one from the other, another mysterious degree. Um, the bulk were engineers, so I can't really say very much about what industrial design or intelligent digital technologies students feel. Um, it's based mainly on engineering because it's they were the main ones who answered. I was hoping for more from industrial design, so I'm going to have to chase them next year. So here's some of the statements. Um, these are ordered from um, best response. So they would um, choose strongly disagree to agree, one to five. Uh, and then I've got the mean response here. So the, the top ones, yes, um, I could choose things that interested me. Um, I was able to see things, design issues in the world around me, uh, and I was able to understand real world design topics. So all of these things uh, came out um, with quite good responses, and I was really happy to see that. Um, the design workbooks are relevant to course topics, yay. Uh, and I wanted to know about the word limits. I was thinking it might be a bit low, but I just wanted to get a, a, a feeling. They think it's quite right, but I think it's probably a bit low, and I want to increase it. And um, they did say the design workbook activities were interesting to do. So it, these were all um, some quite good responses. Um, I wanted to know a bit about the systems, and these are the final set of statements. Um, so the CS the ePortfolio system was relatively easy to use. Um, PebblePad has its quirks. Um, it can be a little challenging at times. So I was expecting that actually to be lower, but it actually came out OK. Um, and the students felt that it supported my learning. Um, in terms of lower than four, um, there were some comments here about the marks, um, and I can talk about this a bit more, but some people felt that um, they'd love to have more marks for a variety of reasons, and some of them um, indicated the design workbooks were maybe not so relevant to my future career, and I can address that too as to why they feel that way. But that the main thing I'd like to say is that they certainly seem to find it, if I go back a slide, I could choose things that interested me. I was able to see design around the world me and I could really link it to real world topics. And so I was really happy to see those types of responses. I wanted to know about how long it took them in terms of time. Um, I was hoping um, that it would, I didn't want it to take too much time um, because it's only 2%. But it adds up to 10% overall. Um, and so I asked them, well, how long does it take you on average to complete per activity? So there's two groups here I've highlighted somewhere between 14, or oh, sorry, 15 minutes to 44 minutes with people at either end. Um, so I'm thinking that's I would probably like it to take a little bit more than that. Um, so I was thinking about a bit about changing um, some things about the task in future years. I, well, I can sometimes see that some students uh, had clearly done um not a great job that those eight students 15 minutes so occasionally you would see someone who wrote very little or barely scratched the surface um, whereas at the top end 45 minutes or 60 minutes they often wrote uh, almost essays sometimes um, that were really really good um, so I'd like to give them um, more of an opportunity with this particular task but you can see there's a range of times now I did ask them about well what was your favorite and so on screen now you can probably see well favorite versus career relevant. Um, so if I look at the favorites first, biomimicry was the winner by far. They all really liked biomimicry. I had got lots and lots of comments about that. And pleasingly, none of them um, responded that I didn't like any of the activities. So I put a smiley mark there. Now, in terms of career relevant, this is where it gets quite interesting. Um, Scamper and the UN goals came up really strongly as being relevant to careers. And there was a sprinkling across all the others. And there were five students who said none of these activities were career relevant to me. And I'll talk about that in a moment. But that will give you a bit of a snapshot um, about what people feel. And, and Scamper came out um, really, really strongly, um, both as a favorite and as being very career relevant. Um, they also really loved biomimicry. 
So moving on, here are some comments. Um, I did have questions saying, well, why did you choose that activity? So for those who chose bad design, I'm not going to read all of this slide. I think you can see it yourselves, but I only wanted to highlight a couple of things I've put in bold. So bad design, they said that if you explain why something is bad and you also um, address trying to fix it, that display is a true engineer. So they're clearly thinking about what it means to become an engineer. Um, and others related to their future field of work and how you plan things, perhaps to avoid being on the worst designs list, but they were thinking about how it might be relevant to their career. In terms of number two, interesting design, I really liked this comment about something I saw as homework, I actually ended up seeing as curiosity. And I did get comments from students saying they really enjoyed the activities and they saw them as thinking exercises. And so they would go and do something boring from one of their other courses. And then this would be something interesting that was relevant to them. And they would go and enjoy doing the activity. Biomimicry, very strong um, there. They love the concept. And um, there's a comment here about being relevant to future careers because um, using nature or being inspired by the natural world um, is an important thing to think about when trying to solve modern problems. Uh, some others, activities. Uh, Scamper, they really liked in terms of, um, it, I think it promoted people to think about how you actually make a solution. Like, like if you have to think about what can you eliminate from a design, what, do you, what could you potentially make bigger? How might you adapt existing designs? It makes them think about more about how designs, um, why designs are designed that way. And there were all a variety of comments about how, how it would be linked to my interest or whatever my career might be. Um, the UN goals also mentioned there were comments about it was uh, I could I could research things that I was interested in that had been bothering me for a while. Now the nun one is quite interesting. Um, when I asked them, okay, you said it's not relevant to your career, why? Um, a number of the comments were related to what that person thought their job would be. Um, I normally ask for give me a product or give me infrastructure, and so some students from potentially software engineering or from the um, intelligent digital technologies degree uh, mentioned that, uh, well, it would be more relevant to me if I could explore user interface or user experience. And in previous years, I've actually had people do that there because it's still a product and they would give me a screenshot of a poorly designed product or a, a poorly designed, um, a screen from an app or even a poorly done website. But this year I didn't see any of that. So they may not have realized that, yes, you can actually choose that um, as being relevant to you. And there was another student here who said, I'm going to be designing technology or products, not infrastructure. So perhaps that student hadn't read the part that said, choose a product or infrastructure. Uh, so sometimes people may not be reading the task. Um, there were also some others who said, I'm not really sure what my career is. So I can't say if it's relevant to me or not, because I don't know what my career is going to be yet as well. So that was also an interesting one. Uh, let's have a quick look at some of the comments that came from the open comments. So uh, this is grouped around activities being fun and interesting. So uh, there's two comments here. I think you can read them yourselves, but it was all about um, the activities start to make you think. Uh, what would an actual engineer have to do uh, about this? So I was trying to get them to think about, well, how would you approach this from an engineering point of view? And there were many comments, but I was always able to find a topic which interested me and they could, good, they could go and research it, look out there and see how is this topic relevant to the real world in a way that appealed to them. Um, there were also comments from a student about um, saying every time I look at an object now, I, I'm looking at things from an engineering point of view and it had changed the way um, they look at things when, when they just look at any type of machinery. So it was really quite good that I was able to promote that. This one's on time and marks. Um, there were some comments related to, uh, it's an easy activity, yeah, it's two marks, got to be easy for us to mark. Um, and it was a hell of a way of um, perhaps people who weren't used to the workload, they could actually do it and they were relevant to the course assessments. And there's a comment here about extra credit, yay. Um, so this is probably one of the people who was asking me, can I have 12 marks? Um, but they did um, find it, um, it didn't take too much time but it was relevant to the course assessment, which was helpful. And the last comment here, I often wrote a lot, um, but I didn't feel it was too much. And there was a preference for this type of, um, we are not allowed to mark or we'll give marks to attendance. So typically there'll be a, a quiz or there'll be in the maths courses, they'll typically use 
come into class, answer some questions, you get marks for that. So they mentioned that this type of participation mark system was a bit fairer, perhaps, in terms of the weighting. Um, so if you've got something worth 1%, um, how many, how much time should something that's worth 1% or 2% actually be? Something I wrestle with, but I'm not sure that 1% should take two hours. Um, so that's something to think about. Um, again, grades and group work. This is related to some of the people that were saying that 2% is not um, the, the best amount of marks. A number of students wanted more marks or to do more of them so that it wouldn't be just 10%, it would be more. As it's a group course, um, there's always the fear from certain groups that my group members are going to pull me down or I'm not going to get marked fairly because of my group. Um, and I have to say the, the course is 40% group work. I do use a peer feedback system to help, but there were some feedback here saying that um, these activities could be useful. Um, maybe if they're worth more, um, it would uh, reduce the risk to my grade. Um, the second comment here, the person was stating that maybe you could have a, I normally have a minimum word limit, minimum 150 words, um, but there were some suggestions about uh, maybe you could have a word range because sometimes people actually wrote quite a lot. So in future, I'm actually going to be giving a word limit saying the minimum word limit is X, but most people will write between um, three to 600 words uh, or whatever it might be. But some people did really write a lot and it was really well written and interesting. Um, and for those like, people who thought mm, activities, well, mm, kind of boring, meh, um, two comments here. Uh, the first comment comes from someone who did all five activities, um, or five of the six chances, I guess. Um, because it's only 10% and the other parts of the car course are worth more, this person felt the activities weren't really a core focus. Uh, and I can understand that. And um, my the second comment here from a gentleman or a person who did one activity, obviously a hardworking student, he did one of six, it's a waste of time. So perhaps that person did one, um, but just doesn't see value in doing them. Um, and so one thing is I don't really know yet about why people don't engage with activities. And that's something I need to look at um, in future. But one activity, it's a waste of time. That person is probably not engaging with them. So what am I going to do about this now? Um, so I'm going to increase the minimum word limit. Um, and the second point here, lots of students did include references, um, but many didn't. And I'm finding in later courses, they clearly don't know how to reference or use them, even though they say they know. So I'm going to um, look at uh, more explicit teaching of that um, next term. And I'm going to make it a bit, my third point here, make it a bit easier so people in software engineering or the Bachelor of Intelligent Digital Technologies, people realize that, yes, you can also use um, user interfaces or um, other products um, related to your major as examples of good design or bad design or, or things that you want to um, attack that are relevant to UN goals. And perhaps the most important one, the fourth point here, I'd like to know more from the people who don't engage. There are actually people who got zero out of 10. Um, there is a long tail of like ones and twos and threes out of 10. And usually when people are getting low marks, I would talk to them in class or one of my tutors would talk to them in class. Or if they weren't attending, I would call them and reach out to them. But I still like to know a bit more about why people don't engage with the activities because most students did. And for everybody out there in the audience, the fifth point is probably the most important. We All of us need to think about how can we link course topics to what's happening in the real world? How are they going to use this in the real world when, when they're graduating? Or how would an engineer or designer use this particular topic? So whatever your course may be, you really need to put some time into thinking about, okay, well, how does this concept or topic or module or content, whatever it might be, how can students use this? Um, how is it applied in the real world? And if you, if you can link it that way better, you're more likely to get engagement. So just a couple of quick comments to recap. Um, on the whole, um, the activities were seen to be um, interesting, and most of them said they were relevant to their future careers, of the ones that responded anyway. Um, and again, this is primarily engineering students because the a huge number of them responded to the survey. I, I did like the fact that they commented that they could choose design topics that interested them, which is what I was hoping they would do. And I also wanted them to be able to look around the world and see design around them. Um, the last comment here is not um, from the survey itself. It was a comment on my end of course feedback. Um, and it was a comment again, 
like it's a great way to learn concepts by applying them to the world we live in. And so I'm trying to make sure that some of the things that I'm covering in that course are actually situated in the real world uh, and make more sense to the student cohort. So again, I'd really encourage whatever course you may be doing, how can you link it to real world outcomes? Um, too often, course content is divorced from reality. So you need to think about how does it link to the real world? Um, we need to tell that to our maths teaching colleagues, I think. Um, and last, um, thank you for e-attending. So I'm reaching my hand out from my screen, uh, wishing you well. Um, thank you very much for coming and speak to me today um, for 45 minutes or so. Um, so I hope there was something of useful there uh, and I'm happy to take any questions um, and I'll hand back over to Ivan. Uh, thanks, Simon. Thanks for a very interesting presentation. Um, do you have any questions from the attendees? Let's see. Um, well, if you have questions, you can either write them in the chat or you can just ask uh, if you use your mic. That should be probably all right. Far away, ladies and gentlemen. Go ahead, Roger. I can see you waving at the camera should, there. I'm yeah, sure there will be. I, I see. I'm the only one with a camera on, apart from yourself. Um, uh, thanks, Simon. That was, that was great. Um, it reminds me of, of uh, yeah, many, many activities passed with first year students, and I, <laughs> I can certainly, and I can certainly um, support the the idea that you know, unless unless you remind students that an app is also a product, yeah, they sometimes they just don't make that connection. And, Yes, I was surprised by that because in previous years yeah. I've actually had students um, show screenshots of apps or or show really yeah. poorly designed yeah. websites, but that didn't happen this year. Yeah. For some reason, yeah. they didn't connect that to a product. I'm not quite sure why. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So you know, I can remember picking out a few Microsoft examples um, to show students about bad user interface design. Um, but the, what I was going to talk about was the use of the word group versus the the word team. Yes, yes, yes. And um, and I wonder if students get the wrong message when we talk about group work, um, when what we really mean is teamwork. And and they don't, yeah. You know, and the distinction I know in that first year yeah. textbook of ours uh, that with that um, David Dowling makes is you know a group is like a study group. It, they're they're mm -hmm. they're a group of people who come together and they do they do. Um, they do kind of cooperate, but but nobody really has much of a stake in the game. Yeah. But a team a team is has a very specific purpose, and I think I think most of what we do is actually teamwork. Uh, you know, we we don't have the Australian cricket group. We have the Australian <laughs> cricket team, um, and um, and I think I think uh, yeah, we it, it might be useful to to help students understand that distinction. I do use that language with them and say to them, particularly in the early weeks where I refer to like, now you're forming a group, but and you don't actually know each other very well yet. And so we need to somehow transform you from a group into a team. Um, uh, I do use a peer feedback system, but I'm still finding, I think I need to do a lot more work on helping them learn how to work in teams. It does seem... I mean, I'm 55 and I, I remember working in teams a lot or groups a lot in high school, but I don't think they, they've all said they don't um, seem to do that in school anymore. So group work or teamwork mm. or even working with other people, it's alien to them. Um, so I think probably we need to do, I need to do a lot more work next year about explicitly structuring this um, to help yeah. them become a team. Yeah, and I, and I wonder if there's an activity that's required to help them connect with their career future. Um, I know one of the activities we used at RMIT years ago was to get them to go and read some job advertisements. Yes. And just start to go, oh, is that what employers are looking for? Um, yes, yes, yes. And, That's yeah. what engineers then, do. Yeah. Well, what a surprise. Um, yeah. Anyway. Yes, yeah, so I do have a, there's a separate task like that in there. It's a 10 percenter where they have to yeah. actually go and uh, I ask them to apply to join a major. So I get them to go and research yeah. um, majors and they'd have to apply to join a major. And they, they give me this kind of application to transfer to a major, which helps okay. them look at, okay, well, what, what different majors are there? But what skills are employers looking for? And more importantly, what skills do you actually need to develop 
Um, yeah. And that one they seem to respond to well. But I'm going to play with increasing the weighting of that one, but it's yeah. too hard to mark really quickly. So that one's more of a standard task. But yeah, um, yeah. You know, I take your point. I might have them, and, and it's useful to have another activity where I can say to them, "What are some of the things you're doing? How does that relate to a future career? Or how can you see yeah. you're going to apply this?" That's right, Chris. You, you don't have to look at too many job advertisements to find the answers. Yes, um, in, in my experience, you know. But anyway, all right. I'll um, I'll get off the air and, and let somebody else have a have a question. Thanks. Um, um, I will have a few comments in the chat. So, yep. um, uh, Amir was asking if there is any difference between Gold Coast and Nathan, Coast and Nathan campuses. So, uh, like, yeah, we have uh, two different campuses at Griffith. Uh, if uh, some of you don't know, we have uh, Gold Coast and Nathan. So. Um, did you notice any difference or something? Um, oh, I can't remember offhand for the actual activity marks. I probably looked and I don't think there was anything significantly different. But um, in terms of the overall course, yes. Um, fail rate at Nathan is probably double Gold Coast. Um, lots of them just didn't submit the final task, which means they fail instantly. Um, probably the marks up there were a bit lower, um, but I'm not, I can't remember if there was a difference in activity marks between the two campuses. I have a feeling there wasn't, at least not a significant one. Um, okay. Thanks. Um, Hugo and Zunko saying great presentation, Simon. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for what uh, you're doing with the first year courses. Uh, who is Zunko saying that uh, it's actually like nice um, uh, idea to deal with the tendons? Yes. So, um, yes. Uh, did you notice that it was like 100% attendance or there were still like students who actually try to skip this like little activities and stuff like uh, that? That There is a range. So there were, I mean, I typically, I take attendance in class. I go around and ask them and I typically say, well, do you know where, if who's not, if someone's missing, do you know where this person is? Have they been in contact with you? Because it's a group project. And so I normally say to them, look, if you're going to be away for whatever reason, you need to tell um your group um what you're doing and why um so i do find it helps drive attendance i think because they know there's i mean two percent is not a huge amount but it certainly seems to help and and they know that i mean if they were late uh, if they submit the work late it's a zero so occasionally i get people say i submit on time it's like no you didn't and i can prove it um but i think it does help with attendance and because there are presentations and again if they don't attend the presentation they get zero um, it does seem the attendance is regular, yes. Um, so it certainly helps with that. Um, but I had it really explicit that, look, if you can't attend and you've got medical reasons, you know, someone's died or whatever has happened, tell me. But look, if you have to go to work, that's your choice. Uh, I'm not going to give you marks for that. That's your choice. Yeah. I will have a comment and I think a question from uh, Venkat Jaswaran. Um, so um, is there any specific uh, curriculum in terms of um, uh, creative engineering? I think we have only yeah, one yeah, course yeah. at Griffith, but I'm not sure, I mean, if there is anything more. Yeah. So can you please um, maybe elaborate on this? And another comment, a question, is there any video course any video available? Any video course available. Um, um, forgive me if I can't pronounce your name, um, Venka perhaps for short, but um, there are um, some really good tools out there. I'm, I'm not sure that there is any specific curriculum available. Uh, I mean, if you want, I'd be happy to talk to you another time. You're welcome to email me. Um, we have two design courses in first year. They both revolve around projects, but um, there are particular um, tools and resources that you may find useful. I'm not sure if there's a video, but um, let me just have a quick look. I might be, have the link that I can paste in the chat. Um, there is a website. I'll just paste it in the chat now. Um, there's a website here, Interaction Design. Um, they've got quite a lot of good um, resources and um, you would also want to, and I'm just typing this as well, design thinking is great because the course, um, the creative engineering is actually built around a design thinking approach. So um, if you Google design thinking, um, there's lots of great resources from um, idio.org, I think, um, and I built my course around some of these particular topics. Um, but 
basically you need a project uh, and you support that project with some tools to help people learn how to design and come up with ideas. So again, um, and also one more I'll type as well. Um, if you Google Scamper, there's some really quite nice handouts on, on that help students think about how they might um, be uh, more productive. And one more, this one, TRIZ is great too. I also teach TRIZ and this is something I got from A squared, E squared, I think. Um, there's some really quite good tools for TRIZ. So um, to the person who asked about um, the curriculum and resources, I suggest you look at Design Thinking, Scamper and TRIZ in particular. They're all fantastic tools for idea generation. And Rogers just pasted an article now and there, there are some actually quite good articles out there. Um, I've forgotten the gentleman's name, but there are one or two um, quite good articles on how we might teach creativity in courses. So I think you'll find there's some stuff in the literature as well. I hope that answers your question. Well, thanks, Simon. You have uh, provided lots of information. <laughs> um, yes, uh, thanks, Roger. Yeah, Yuri, I saw a couple of presentations from Yuri about uh, about TRIZ, and so I, uh, I, I really like TRIZ, and I teach it as something that they can use from first year but it, the tools can grow so if I, I can i know there's a couple of mechanical engineering people in the audience there so i would suggest that they also build on some of that triz stuff in the later courses and some of the other idea generation tools that require a bit more advanced knowledge can be really useful um well i think we have uh, time for maybe just one more question anybody would like to ask yeah i don't we just um Okay, then I uh, can ask you a question, Simon, since like yep. nobody wants to ask. So uh, not just question, just like uh, your thoughts, right? So like usually like um, when you read the literature, right, they say that uh, in each course you typically like require like about four or five assessment items, right? Yeah, just yeah. like, um, so I kind of have like similar thing in one of my courses, like what you're doing. So if you have like this like little assessment items ready four or five and i saw that you have another one like uh, um something like uh like bigger portfolio yes presentation so like uh, all together we have like i don't know seven eight nine assessment items so so uh, what are your thoughts about that so like having like so many assessment items during the sure. course and well, just like one of like uh, hear your thoughts. That's it. <laughs> uh, I think it's about the how you explain it to students and that they're linking to things. Um, so I normally say to them, look, the presentations are linked and they lead to the portfolio. So they do a presentation in week three, six, and ten, and those three presentations are linked and they help them develop the portfolio. And I normally say to them that the idea is you're building your knowledge through the course and all the assessment items are linked and they can get feedback. Like the, the presentation on the feedback on the first presentation helps them do better in the second one. So I normally explain to them that everything is linked. It's not these isolated items. They're all connected and they seem to respond more to that. Um, I did get some feedback where sometimes in a course, you'll do an assessment item, you submit it, it goes away, gets marked, but you don't actually use that for anything. Like you can't use that knowledge to do something again, or it's just this isolated thing that goes off into the void. So I suspect it's good to have some kind of connections between the assessment items so people can improve as they go through. It's not always possible, but it's nice to have some kind of connection between them. And they don't seem to mind. I didn't get any negative feedback about saying there's too many activities in, in this particular course, luckily. But I think it's about how you sell it and how you explain why they're doing this. And that, that seems to work. Uh, I generally phrase it as something like, this is to help you engage more deeply with the course content. And I want you to think about it and connect it to your interests. So, so go off and do this activity and we'll look at it next week. Uh, and, and, and that seems to be okay. Yeah. Well, um, thanks, Simon. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, I think it's about time to conclude the session. So thanks uh, everybody for attending uh, Simon's presentation. Simon, thanks for your time. Thanks for sharing your experience. Um, there is lots uh, to share. And uh, yeah, um, everybody, please uh, have a nice day and uh, we'll probably see you in, uh, I think two weeks, we have another one that will be at, at the final webinar for uh, this week. Thanks everybody and have a nice day. Thank you everybody for attending. Have a lovely weekend. Thank you, Simon and Ivan. Thank you. Bye everyone. Cheers. See you later. Yeah, bye everybody.